Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Cameras and Coffee. Today's video is sponsored by The Coldest Water. And I also want to thank James for sending up a few bags of coffee from his local coffee roaster, What's the Buzz? This is Tanzania Peaberry, and it is fantastic. So, thank you very much, James. In today's video, second, I'm going to have more of this. In today's video, we're going to talk about the work that a company that's been around since 2002 called Pickle, P-I-Q-L, is doing. Now, I first heard about these guys back in, I don't remember exactly when, but going back and looking for more information on them, I found this F-Stoppers article uh, from December by Mike Smith. It's called, How to Back Up Your Digital Photos to Film. Okay. So the F-Stoppers article is linked in the description as well as the company's website, so you can do more research about these if you're interested in it. The general gist of the article is that bit rot is real and data is being lost. And now I don't know about you guys, but I want to try and go look at some of my old high, uh, college and grad school papers. Can't even open them because the, the, the word, edit, word processing program I used, I can't nothing opens those files anymore. Uh, I tried to go get some archives off of my old zip drive, 40 megabyte zip drive. Mm, can't do that, can't even connect it to my computer. So, um, so bit rot is real and it occurs in the span of decades. Whereas if you look at things like film, as long as we're not talking about nitrate film, but if you're looking at, at acetate film, which is, um, stable or polyester based film which is stable uh, then it can last a very very long time and that's why we have things like daguerreotypes from the 1800s that are still around because they are stable for hundreds potentially thousands of years okay um, so what this company pickle is doing is they are taking one kilometer long rolls of of 35 millimeter film. So what is a kilometer? For those of you in the US, I'm going to use the standard US measurement system. It is three times, one kilometer is three Nimitz class aircraft carrier lengths. So uh, a kilometer is a lot of film. And if, if you've ever spooled your own 35 millimeter at home, that's 100 feet, which is, uh, it would take 328 of those to reach a kilometer. If you've bought Cineth film in 2,000 foot lengths, no, it's two, I was doing 200. Uh, 2,000 feet, it's, it's a one and a half of those is a kilometer of, of, of film. It's a kilometer is 3,280 feet. So at any rate, um, what basically what this company Pickle is doing is they're taking 35 millimeter film and they are projecting data onto it in what looks basically like television static. It's described as a mic as a nano data QR code. Each one of these Q according to F stoppers, each one of these frames can hold something like uh, eight megs. Was it? Uh, yeah, I think eight megabytes and basically a, a kilometer of film with this technology can hold about 120 gigs which is a little bit less space efficient than like a 128 gigabyte SD card for comparison. And so, and then they get stored up in the Arctic where they can theoretically last for thousands of years. But it got me to thinking like they're encoding these things in fancy QR codes. So you're gonna have to have the ability to read them in the future. And yeah, there's apparently some, some human readable instructions at the front of it, but that's going to be predicated upon somebody having the computing technology that is rudimentary enough in the future to go back and, and do this. And, and I mean, this, this is something that could potentially be useful for storing things like, like text documents. Like if you wanted to encode the entire Library of Congress 
onto some number of kilometers of film and store it, you could probably do that and then it would be recoverable. But then at that point, why not just record it as text? And so I got to thinking, is there a better way to do this? And I was, as I was thinking about this, I recalled a conversation I had with, with someone I used to know some good number of years ago. And um, I was over at his house one day and, and uh, he, was, he's a, he was an optics engineer. And I had one of my cameras with me and he, he asked, oh, what, tell me about that lens. And, and we were talking about the specs on it. And I said, it's, it's pretty sharp. It's, it tests at like 175 line pairs per millimeter. He goes, oh, per millimeter. Well, yeah, I mean, how else would you test it? He says, um, I mean, I knew he designed optics, but I didn't really know what they were for or how good they were. And he said, well, at my company, when we test optics, we rank them with similar numbers, but by micrometer. So the lenses that he was designing, he was on a team of engineers doing this, were rated at some, num some significant number of, of line pairs per micrometer. And I was like, what? what? I said, wait. <laughs> My first question, of course, was could you even use those for taking photos? He said, well, in theory, yeah, I mean, all lenses focus light, but we're talking about lenses that have a flange, what would be called a flange focal distance of a millimeter or less. And uh, what they would do, it, and he said also there's a matter of cost. A single element in one of our lenses is, costs us $100,000 to make. Uh, our most expensive single lens element is a million dollars to make, give or take said most of our companies are most of our customers are buying lenses from us it cost one to one and a half million dollars for us to make and um he was and, and so so he he explained that basically his lenses weren't for imagery they were for focusing laser light and then that laser light would be used to etch very very fine detail into things for making circuit boards that's the purpose of that and when we're talking when you're talking about um, circuit board architecture and wafers and things like that that have very intricate pathways for the electricity to follow that transmits the data, then it makes absolute sense that you would want to have your laser light be focused on a uh, micrometer wave uh, width, m a fractional micrometer wave uh, width, so that you can get the most number of pathways into a, a chip as possible. So, so different purpose and not in any way, shape, or form practical for imagery. However, it got me thinking that a high, it's become like a refrain on this channel. If you want to look at what a good way to do things in film photography is, look at the way it was done successfully for years. And so I got to thinking about, after that, uh, re recalling that conversation about microfilm. And I'm old enough to remember going to an actual library before the libraries had computers in them, before web crawler, for those of you old enough to remember, remember what that is, and going into a card catalog so that I could look up with the Dewey Decimal System a location for a microfilm, which I could then go and hopefully it was in the right place, pull it from that right place, put it into a microfilm reader, project it onto the base of the microfilm reader, look through goggles so that I could actually read the stuff, focus in the microfilm, and then pull articles to research for, for papers. And uh, why not just store data like they did with microfilm? And so like, this is how I would do it. Sorry, I hope I didn't hit the mic. This is how I would do it if I were going to go about this process. Firstly, if you have a digital file, you need a high-res digital file and a lens that will then reduce it to a 35 millimeter size negative. And that becomes not that hard. If you have something like a really, really high-resolution projector, like maybe a 12 megapixel or higher resolution projector, you could store a reasonably good copy of a digital file on film and then project it through a very high resolution lens to reduce that, that projection 
to the size of a 35 millimeter negative. And then if you have the projector, it doesn't just have to be images. It could literally be anything that there is a digital copy of. You're looking at PDFs of old books. That's how I would do it. Same thing, just project it right onto the negative. Because images, one of the wonderful things about photography is that you don't have to speak any language or you could speak any language or any number of them and you can pretty much understand what a photo is trying to tell you because experientially we all see the world uh, similarly and our perceptions of it yes are defined by our different cultures and the languages we speak and things like that but the way that we we see the world is it, it, Photography is a, a unique art form and that is the one that speaks most universally to people regardless of what language or culture they came up in. So recording an image as an actual image for the future instead of just as data bytes not only seems significantly more uh, data space friendly but also much more universally usable in the future. Because in the future all anyone's going to need to see that image again is a light source and some way to enlarge it. And that's pretty simple. That's much easier to do than going back and saying, look at all of this, all of this static. Now here are instructions on how your future computer systems that we don't understand can potentially maybe decode all that. So the simplest solution is generally going to be the best. So anyway, that's my business idea for today. And if you are looking for a way to make yourself millions of dollars, all you need to do is buy one of these super, super expensive lenses with a completely impractical flange focal distance and a super high end, possibly doesn't even exist yet, digital light projector and uh, go to town. You can, you can make a really good living for yourself digitizing other people's data onto, uh, onto film. And hey, here's another thing for you. If you want to get the highest resolution you can, take a look at ADOC CMS 22, which if it's been about a year since I read the data sheet, I think it tests out at around 350 line pairs per millimeter, maybe a little bit less, I can't remember for sure. It is the highest resolution film being made today, which, uh, which, which means that you can really do a very good job of recording your information onto that film. And ADOC is uh, an awesome company. They are very cool. So um, they make great film and they always answer my questions. I appreciate that no end from them. Um, at any rate, so what can you do? So, so the other thing I wanted to talk about today was what can you do as a photographer with digital files? If you are watching this video, you have digital files that can help prevent you from suffering bit rot. First thing is keep your files backed up. So you keep them on your hard drive that you're using keep them on a second hard drive. One of the best things you can do for yourself as a photographer is make sure that your computer has a second hard drive in it and then use that to back up your data. So when uh, I haven't set this up on my computer, I know I'm really negligent on this, but I believe that in Windows 10, for instance, I don't use Mac, I can't talk to that, but in Windows you can set up data backups that are done automatically by the computer. It's one of my to do's for this week. So if you have a second hard drive inside your computer, um, you, can, you can do that automatically. If you have a tower, like I have a full tower back in the photo editing room, and you can stack 15 hard drives in it, there's nothing wrong with that either, turning your computer into a RAID system. Um, the other thing that, that I do is I also have external hard drives. So every year I buy some external hard drives, two for video, two for photos, and then periodically I manually back up all of my photos and videos, the final files at least, to those. And then those get stacked. And that way if I drop one of those two external hard drives or one of them gets shorted or something like that, I still have that backup. So basically my practice is to have the files that I work off of, the, an internal hard drive that holds the backups of the files that um, I'm working on actively, and then external hard drives that keep backup data. And then I also have um, mid-res files that I, of all of my photos that I store online and then all my final YouTube videos of course come up to YouTube. 
my biggest fear, of course, would be having like a short come through and fry all my data that's in my computer. And then it having been like a month since I did my most recent backup. Um, but uh, at any rate, when, when you are backing up data, if you're keeping all of your data on the same machine, you don't actually have a backup. In fact, the, pe the people I know who are really particular about, about backups will say, if you, if you do not have your data on your machine, on a second hard drive near you, on the cloud, and in a second location on the cloud, then you don't actually have enough backups and you risk losing all of your data. So um, functionally, that's not easy to do as a photographer, especially if you're out there shooting high-res digital files on any kind of regular basis and editing and raw, shooting 4K video, which takes up so, so much hard drive space. Um, so at any rate, um, those were, those were my thoughts on data backups and some tips that I hope you guys find very useful on what you can do to back up your data as well and make sure that if you do have a catastrophic computer failure, you also don't have a catastrophic data loss. Next thing, uh, this coming Sunday, is it, I think it's Sunday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, yeah. This coming Sunday, uh, I will be announcing the winner of Film February, my winner of Film February. And I'm also gonna go through four, role, four of the roles of film that were runners up. So there were some exceptional, exceptional roles of film there, guys. And um, I was also really glad to see how many names I recognized uh, who had submitted roles of film from the comments section. So uh, look for that on Sunday sometime. And uh, we'll, we'll go over who won and why and talk about some of the other really amazing photos that, we, that were there. Take care, and I'll see you next time.